We're going to get started. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Pulmonary Grand Rounds. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Gabriela Wilson um, you know, presenting. Um, and today I, I want to uh, you know, just welcome our applicants that are joining us uh, via, via video. Um, we're happy that you're joining us uh, for this uh, great presentation. Um, uh, I wanted to introduce Dr. Wilson. She is a member of our Yale Center for Asthma and Airways Disease. Um, she's a graduate of our program, uh, an instructor here in the pulmonary section. Uh, she completed her uh, medical uh, degree at the University of Connecticut, and she uh, trained uh, in residency and fellowship here at Yale. And uh, we're lucky to have her um, in, our, in our center. Uh, she's been really active in both clinically, but also um, kind of like using uh, new methods to characterize patients uh, and specifically uh, molecular uh, characterization of inflammatory profiles in the sputum of uh, children um, in the context of a trial uh, for um, you know, biologics. So it's very topical that we're gonna be hearing her talk today about uh, how we can characterize breakthrough asthma exacerbations in the age of biologics, and we're really excited to hear a little bit more about this topic. So, welcome, and uh, you know, the mic, mic is yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Gomez, for the introduction and everyone for the opportunity to talk about this topic. It's one that I'm uh, really interested in, both clinically and from a research perspective. And I second the thank you to all the applicants joining. I don't know where to look if I like where to look to see them, but wherever you are on Zoom, um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. Um, so, without further ado, this is the CME disclosure and accreditation slide. Um, the number is both on this slide and on the chalkboard here. You can text 470722 to that telephone number there and you'll um, earn your CME credit for this activity. And so I'd like to start with a case vignette. This is something that's probably a very familiar story to everyone you know, in this room or most of us here. Um, and it's a story of Mrs. A, who is a 45-year-old woman. Um, she's an elementary school teacher and she's got a past medical history of adult onset asthma. She uh, says that this was diagnosed about 10 years ago and has a very classic history for it. She says that around that time she noted fluctuating respiratory symptoms that were associated with allergies, viral infections, and some workplace triggers as well. And so she reports she had PFT done 10 years ago. She was told she had asthma at that time. She came to our Winchester clinic. She was prescribed Symbacor, and she actually improved for several years, but unfortunately developed worsening asthma control over the last year or so, despite the usual things, you know, um, like careful trigger avoidance, compliance with her medications, and treatment of her allergies. Spiriva was added to her medication regimen six months ago, but despite this, she has ongoing poor asthma control um, and reports two exacerbations in the last year. And so you're thinking about, you're seeing her in clinic and you're thinking about really where to go next with her. And so you review her labs and she's got evidence of blood, uh, elevated blood eosinophils on her labs dating back several years actually, and multiple allergies on her um, allergen panel to a bunch of different things. And so she does seem to have this picture of an allergic eosinophilic asthma phenotype, right? And so she would probably be um, a good candidate for additional therapy. Uh, you also review her lung function tests and you see that she has pretty severe obstruction actually pre-bronchodilator with a huge response to bronchodilator, 53% increase in her FEV1 and almost normalization of her uh, airway obstruction as well as a pheno of 57, so an elevated pheno, all kind of consistent with the eosinophilic airway inflammation that you think she probably has based on her labs and history. And so you start her on mepolizumab, and initially she does very well on this. She follows up a few months later, her asthma control test score is a 22, indicating good asthma control. Her blood work shows that the mepolizumab has reduced her serum eosinophils quite dramatically. But unfortunately, she has an asthma exacerbation a few months later requiring prednisone. You see her in follow-up after this, and you're wondering kind of where to go next. Her asthma control test score is not great, still reflects some poor asthma control. You try to manage these other comorbidities of hers, thinking that might optimize her. 
But again, she has another exacerbation several months later. And so I think the question for her is really what's next in terms of treatment? She looks to be you know, failing or suboptimally responding to mepolizumab and, and where should we go next for her treatment? This is a uh, common question that we talk about on our YCAD um, meetings that we have weekly when we discuss cases just like this one. And I can't say that I have a definitive guideline-based answer for you as to where to go with a person like this, but my hope is that after um, reviewing you know, prevalence of severe asthma today and talking about risk factors for exacerbation, discussing efficacy and effectiveness of biologics and looking at the data for responders and non-responders, and then reviewing the literature regarding breakthrough exacerbations on um, biologic treatment and, and some proposed mechanisms for suboptimal response. My hope is that after kind of covering these objectives today that you'll have some um, more knowledge with which to approach a patient like this in your clinic and um, uh, in the future. And so just to, to briefly go over kind of why severe asthma is a problem and how much of a problem it is, um, you know, depending on what studies you look at, which, you know, population studies you look at, the prevalence of severe asthma among patients with asthma is about 4 to 10 percent. On the left, you can see, you might have seen this if you've looked at the GINA guidelines. This is um, an excerpt from a study actually published 10 years ago in Jackie. This is a Dutch population study that looked at the prevalence of severe asthma. And you can see they've outlined, you know, 24 percent of patients with asthma have GINA step 4 to 5 um, treatment-dependent asthma. 17% of the patients that they looked at had difficult to treat asthma, so they had poor symptom control despite that degree of treatment. And then 3.7% had uh, what they called severe asthma, so poor symptom control, control despite GINA step 4 to 5 therapy with known good inhaler technique and compliance. On the right, this is a different population study from out of Sweden where they looked at um, prevalence of asthma in, in just a random sampling in, in panel A and then looked at prevalence of severe asthma in a larger just uh, cohort of asthmatic patients. And they got around 10% of patients, 9.5% of patients with asthma having severe asthma. So there's a bit of a range depending on where you look, but anywhere from four to 10%. We know that exacerbations are a, an important um, factor in, in patients with asthma and their um, severe asthma and their control. And so this is taken um, from a, a study that actually looked at three of the MART therapy uh, studies. So it was a large cohort of patients, a large data set of over 7,000 patients. And what they uh, tried to do in this study is um, develop a risk score for predicting uh, asthma exacerbations, essentially. And so all of the patients included in those three MART studies were step three to four GINA uh, treatment patients. They all had some degree of impaired lung function, and they all had had an exacerbation in the preceding year. And what they found was not completely surprising. Um, I'll just take a moment to define severe exacerbation. They used in this study the same ATS definition that we use for a severe exacerbation. So any flare requiring um, three or more days of steroids or any ER or hospitalization visit related to asthma requiring steroids. And what they found, like I said, was not totally surprising. Um, the higher GINA step that you had was more predictive for risk for exacerbation. More frequent as needed reliever therapy use was predicted, um, was a, a predictor for exacerbation risk. Um, degree of lung function impairment also was a predictor for exacerbation risk in this group, post bronchodilator FEV1 um, uh, uh, difference from predicted normal. And then ACQ5 score and uh, BMI as well were both uh, dominant predictors for exacerbation risk. And so what they actually did was they came up with a score, um, a risk score to predict exacerbations in the next six months. They used two thirds of their 7,500 patient data set to come up with the score and then the remaining one third of the data set they used um, to validate the score. And what they found was that, um, you know, this, they gave different, you know, score values as you can see on the left hand table with different uh, threshold um, value cutoffs for each parameter. What they found is that, you know, with this score ranging from zero to 100, they were able to predict a five to 40% risk of exacerbations based on just these factors alone in the study. And this is not a talk about MART therapy, but you can see that there's a difference in the two curves. There's a higher risk of exacerbation in the group, um, the solid line showing fixed dose ICS-LABA compared to the MART therapy groups um, shown in the dotted line. 
This comes from a different study that looked at SARP data, so the Severe Asthma Research Program through NHLBI. These are big cohorts of patients with severe asthma. And so this group looked at um, SARP-3 and then the SARPs-1 and 2 cohorts, so a total of about 2,000 patients. Um, and what they looked for was similarly trying to define predictors for um, exacerbations, but in this case, they focused on exacerbation-prone asthma. So this was defined as, as patients who had three or more exacerbations. And what they found was they looked at demographic factors, they looked at lung function factors, markers of type 2 inflammation as well, and some comorbidities, and found a few um, characteristics that seem to be dominant predictors in both cohorts for risk for exacerbation prone asthma. And so those included the presence of sinusitis, the presence of GERD, um, BMI, and then also blood eosinophils. And so we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the prevalence of severe asthma, the importance of exacerbations, and what some risk factors are for exacerbations. I'd like to shift to what the effects of biologics are on asthma exacerbations. And as we all know, um, asthma exacerbations are reduced by all biologics that are currently approved. Um, this is just a, a quick timeline of biologics. I don't want to bore you with too many details about the initial studies here, um, and I'd like to get into some real world data for you guys. But from RCTs, we know that omalizumab, the first um, approved biologic for asthma, does reduce exacerbations as well as reduce ICS use and rescue inhaler use. Our first anti L5 agent, mepolizumab, has been shown to reduce asthma exacerbations and improve asthma symptoms, lung function, and facilitate weaning maintenance for oral corticosteroids. Resilizumab, which we don't really use here, it's an IV formulation used uh, generally in some other countries, also has been shown to reduce asthma exacerbations and improve lung function. Benralizumab, um, uh, our last anti-L5 agent, uh, also reduces exacerbations, improves lung function, and uh, facilitates weaning of maintenance steroids. Dupilumab, similarly to the other ones, has these same kind of out, uh, outcomes. It reduces exacerbations, improves lung function, and uh, uh, facilitates weaning steroids. And then tezipelumab um, has been shown to reduce exacerbations and improve lung function. Its effect on uh, facilitating weaning steroids is not quite as clear. It was shown to do so in just a subgroup of patients with high blood eosinophils greater than 150. And so there's still some ongoing studies looking at its true effect in, uh, in T2 low patients in terms of weaning uh, maintenance steroids. Um, looking at the main phase three, like pivotal phase three clinical trials for biologics, which are shown here in parentheses under the biologic names at the top, you can kind of, you can see uh, really how much each drug reduced asthma exacerbations by in the populations that they were studied. And granted, the populations were not uh, exactly the same in these studies, but um, you can see across the top, overall exacerbations roughly were reduced by 50% with all of the currently approved biologics that we use in the, um, in their kind of pivotal phase three clinical trials. If you look at subgroup analyses from these clinical trials, you'll see that exacerbation rate reduction was improved in patients who had higher blood eosinophils and really was striking the, the effect that, that of that um, in dupilumab and, and tezipelumab. And so an even more, almost 70% reduction in exacerbation in that subgroup of patients. And then you can see similarly with pheno cutoffs, um, that degree of exacerbation reduction with dupilumab and tezipelumab. And then at the bottom here, you can see uh, lung function improvement. Again, this is not a comparative study, and so there, the samples are, you know, the uh, subjects are different, um, so not meant to compare these absolute numbers, but just to show you kind of what they reported in their studies. And so we've talked a little bit really briefly about randomized clinical trial data for um, uh, the efficacy of biologics. But when we think about the real world, we think about assessing effectiveness of biologics outside of the constraints um, and kind of idealized situation of a clinical trial. And so um, most of the studies that have been published uh, looking at real world outcomes have been retrospective observational studies. And there are a few prospective ones and ones that will be one that we'll be starting here that I'll tell you about at the very end um, that are looking at the real world effectiveness of these uh, biologics in our, our patient populations. And so in terms of data for real world effectiveness of mepolizumab, um, this uh, group that I'm, I'll show you here did a study of real world effectiveness of mepolizumab and benralizumab. And so thankfully, 
the next few slides will have the same definitions for responder and non-responder. And so how they defined it was that a responder is um, a patient who had at least a 50% reduction in exacerbations or a 50% reduction in their maintenance oral corticosteroids. Um, and then in terms of super responders, they defined those as patients in their study who uh, started mepolizumab and then for 12 months had no exacerbations and no need for maintenance oral, oral corticosteroids at the end of the year. And what they found, you know, similar to the RCTs, was that exacerbation rates were reduced in all groups, both those who were on, uh, on maintenance oral steroids and those who were not. And ACQ scores were also improved in both groups as well. And then in terms of real numbers, they saw about a 73% um, response rate. So about 73% of patients were considered responders in this study. Super responders, those exacerbation-free patients totally off of steroids, that was about 23% of the cohort. And I should say this, the cohort was about 100 patients, 99. And then non-responders were about 27% of patients in this study in terms of mepolizumab. And then in terms of looking at uh, characteristics of non-responders, they looked at a bunch of different characteristics. And you'll see this is really like you know small in this table. I apologize for that. But basically, uh, in, um, I think you can probably see in column A, they have their super responder data. In column B, they have their responders. In column C, they have the non-responders. And then for the p-values, they compare the super responders to the non-responders and the, um, the responders to the non-responders. So uh, assessing differences between both of the responder groups and the non-responders. And what you can see in terms of their characteristics of non-responders was that they tended to have lower age, they uh, had higher BMI, they tended to not have nasal polyposis. So nasal polyps, actually the presence of that was more common in the responder groups. They had a higher baseline maintenance oral steroid dose, which might not be too surprising, and then a higher baseline ACQ6 score as well. And interestingly, this, this graph kind of shows you how the patients moved between responder and non-responder groups over the course of the study. And at around um, uh, the 24 week mark, a uh, 12 month response rate was seen in over 90% of patients. So it was a, a good time to assess, um, to assess response. Not too many patients crossed in over after that. In terms of real world effectiveness of venralizumab, so again, same definitions here. Responders were um, those who had a 50% reduction at least in exacerbations or steroid dosing, and super responders were exacerbation free and off of steroids at the end of the study. The only caveat that they included here that they didn't previously, this group realized you know, some patients were not able to come completely off of steroids due to adrenal insufficiency, and so they remained on five uh, milligrams or less for adrenal insufficiency purposes, and they consider them as not on steroids for asthma. And so what they found is kind of similar to mepolizumab and similar to the RCT data, asthma exacerbation rates were reduced in this real world study of uh, venralizumab and ACQ uh, scores were improved. Mini AQLQ scores, so asthma quality of life questionnaire scores were improved as well and lung function too. In terms of response numbers, they found that a higher uh, percentage of patients in this cohort of 130 patients um, were responders, 86%. 39% um, were super responders, and then uh, about 14% were uh, designated as non-responders in this group. And so what were the characteristics of these different groups um, in this cohort? So super responders tended to not have any prior exposure to antel 5 treatment, uh, they had decreased baseline maintenance oral corticosteroid dosing. They tended to have nasal polyps, so kind of similar to mepolizumab, that you know, resp more response was seen in patients who had nasal polyps. They had adult onset disease, and then they had higher EOs in the baseline um, measurements and also higher eosinophil peaks looking back at the preceding year before enrollment. And then non-responders, interestingly, um, about a third of the non-responders in the study had evidence of chronic airway infection that was defined by more than one positive sputum culture during the 12 months of treatment, um, either by sputum or BAL. And also roughly a third of those patients had what they presumed to re represent anti-drug antibodies. Um, uh, and they, they um, presumed this based on a sudden rise in blood eosinophils in those patients. I've looked at a, a few studies of this because I think that this phenomenon is kind of interesting. It, this was reported in the initial uh, venralizumab studies and was not noted necessarily to correlate with treatment response. Um, and I think that like the manufacturer, the people who make venralizumab must have their like assay for uh, testing for anti-drug antibodies protected in some way because none of the other studies I've looked at have actually tested with an assay. They've just 
presumed that a sudden rise in blood eosinophils reflects the presence of anti-drug antibodies. But so for what it's worth, that's what they, they thought was occurring in a third of the patients who were non-responders. In terms of dupilumab real-world effectiveness, this was a little bit of a different study. They looked at clinical remission, actually, as an outcome. And so there's a few different definitions of clinical remission in asthma. This is you know, one example that they use. They had these four um, criteria listed in the top left. So those were an ACQ score less than 1.5 and an FEV1 of greater than 80% predicted or a change of at least 100 cc's in their FEV1. Um, no exacerbations for 12 months and then no need for maintenance oral corticosteroids. And what they found was in terms of uh, patients who met clinical remission, actually about 30% of the cohort um, met criteria for clinical remission in this study. And another 47% of patients were considered to be responders to dupilumab in this real world study. This had about 130 patients, kind of similar to the venralizumab study. And then again, close to 20% uh, non-response rate in this study. The predictors of clinical remission for dupilumab were a little bit different. Here, they found that a high baseline eosinophil count and also male um, sex were predictors of, um, of a good response to dupilumab. And then on the right, you can see here predictors of non-response. So a, a low total IgE level actually, age less than 50, and then a pheno less than 30 were predictive of non-response. And then lastly, um, real-world effectiveness of tezupilumab. Um, this is a study of a similar, I think this was like one, either 131 or 136 patients, something along the, that, those lines. Um, they looked at patients who were starting tezupilumab and they followed them up at three and six months, saw significant reductions in asthma exacerbation rates, oral steroid doses, asthma control test scores, and lung function. And in terms of their kind of response rate analysis, they actually used a different assessment tool that I'll, I'll tell you about in just a moment called the BARS, the Biologic Asthma Response Score. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but for the purposes of this, um, the BARS has three kind of outputs for their score, either a good response, a response, or an insufficient response. And so they saw about 40% had a good response, 40% had an insufficient, uh, excuse me, uh, a response, and then 20% had um, an insufficient response. And so there have been a few different um, proposed kind of ways to evaluate biologic response by individual groups, really no consensus around this yet and no guidelines for this. But this is one of the more recent tools that have been proposed. This comes from a group in Germany. Um, uh, basically eight asthma specialists in Germany came together and they developed or identified three criteria that they felt were the most important criteria when assessing response to biologic treatment in asthma. And then they came up with thresholds for what would be a good response in each of those criteria, what would be just a response and what would be um, an insufficient response. And so you can see um, the top row, reduction of exacerbations was the first criteria. And they thought the threshold for a good response was to have no exacerbations or at least a reduction in 75% in terms of exacerbation rates. Um, a response would have been a reduction in exacerbations between 50 and 74%. And then a reduction of less than 50% would have been an insufficient response. Similar kind of thresholds for their second criteria, which was the degree of reduction in terms of maintenance oral corticosteroids. And then lastly, improvement of asthma control as measured by the ACT score. So the minimally clinically important difference on the ACT score is three points. And so for a good response, they thought you either had to have uh, an increase in your ACT score of three points and a score greater than 20, or if your score remained less than 20, you'd have to have an increase of six points. And then you can see here three to five and less than 20 was their threshold for a response. And then um, less than three points was their threshold for an insufficient response. And so the way that uh, this group kind of proposed the scoring system was that for every criteria where you meet threshold for a good response, you get two points. For each criteria where you meet threshold for a response, you get one point, and then you get zero points for any of the insufficient responses. And so taking essentially the mean of all of those three criteria, these are kind of the final bar scores that you would end up with. And so greater than one point, greater than or equal to 1.5 would reflect a good response. 0.5 to 1.5 uh, reflects a response, and then less than 1.5 would reflect an insufficient response. And so they essentially proposed in this study that, you know, this kind of consensus group of, um, of uh, asthma providers, they proposed that really when you start a biologic at the three-month mark, 
for the most part, you're just going to be assessing tolerability. You can start to see some degree of response at that point. Some patients do come to us and, and note a, a significant response by then. But in terms of stopping treatment at the three-month mark, usually it would be because of intolerability. And then really what you will, when you really will do your first assessment of response to drug would be at six months and you would use this tool to do so. And you can see that if patients have a good response, they have a score of 1.5 or higher, then you'd obviously continue the medication. If they have a, a response, then you might think about optimizing different factors. And so things that they considered here were inhaler technique, comorbidity management, allergen avoidance, those sorts of things that we kind of are always thinking about trying to optimize in our patients with asthma. And then lastly, if you had evidence of an insufficient response, then you might think about um, uh, switching biologics at that time. And then lastly, um, I'll end this kind of section of my talk with one comparative study of biologics. Um, this, these were based off of indirect comparisons of patients taking uh, biologic medications. I want to say the, the sample size was about 5,000 patients. This was a, a claims-based analysis. And what the authors did was they looked at response rates between each drug uh, while controlling for various factors that weren't controlled for when you compare the studies individually on their own. So controlling for um, asthma severity, demographic factors, and comorbidities as well. And what they see, you know, in the top panel, they have all patients shown. And then in the bottom, patients specifically with two or more exacerbations in the year prior to treatment. And what you can see in the top is that all biologics reduced exacerbations. It looks like dupilumab and uh, um, benralizumab did the best job in terms of reducing exacerbations in the top panel. And then in the bottom panel, you can see all the biologics actually did better in those patients who were having frequent exacerbations before treatment um, with you know, the best performer by this indirect comparison being um, dupilumab. And so there have been no head-to-head -head comparison trials of these drugs. So at this point, we're, you know, when we're trying to decide you know, which might be better, you know, this, um, this could indicate that dupilumab might be a little bit better than the others. And then um, in terms of prediction tools for response to biologics, so we talked a little bit about a biologic assessment response tool, but this is more, um, I wanna just touch on the idea of a prediction tool for biologic response. Um, this is uh, one group that did a post-hoc analysis specifically just of uh, mepolizumab treated patients from the DREAM study and the Menza studies and tried to identify um, uh, factors that were associated with treatment benefit in terms of reducing um, uh, exacerbations and reducing and improving, excuse me, ACQ6 score. And what you can see is that, you know, the factors that predict those different outcomes are actually different. Um, so on the left, you can see that um, those were the dominant factors for predicting treatment benefit in terms of exacerbation reduction. And you can see exacerbation history was the most predictive. Um, blood eosinophil count was next, uh, baseline ACQ5 score, age, and then um, long-term OCS use. And you can see, you know, on the right-hand side, a different set of predictors for uh, treatment benefit with mepolizumab in terms of ACQ5 score. So blood eosinophil count, nasal polyposis, Hispanic ethnicity, and then also uh, long-term OCS use and um, asthma duration. So these authors, you know, they proposed that factors like these should be studied and then a prediction tool should be developed to try and predict um, uh, treatment benefit, you know, the probability of treatment benefit for these different outcomes, but they did not devise a tool yet. And so to my knowledge, there's not yet a good prediction tool, but people are thinking about it and, and hopefully working on it. Um, but definitely something that I think we need. In terms of why some um, uh, patients have this suboptimal response, you know, in the real world studies, we saw anywhere from 14 to almost 30% of non-responders, depending on the biologic that we, that we reviewed. Um, there are a number of different theories as to why, you know, mechanisms uh, that might explain suboptimal response. And so, for one, it's been thought that peripheral, you know, it's been shown that peripheral blood eosinophils, their correlation to sputum eosinophils um, does kind of break down as asthma severity increases. And so, on the left-hand side, you can see that's um, a graph of a cohort of about 50 patients that have severe asthma that are all on chronic oral corticosteroids. And really, there's not a great correlation between their sputum and their blood eosinophils. 
And then on the right hand side, this is um, a, a plot of six studies that looked at the correlation between sputum and blood eosinophils separated by the severity of asthma that the uh, studies included. And you can see in the you know, bottom right hand corner, the severe red dot, those are oral corticosteroid dependent patients as well in that study. Really not a great correlation in terms of blood eosinophils and, and airway eosinophilia. And I think that's really important because blood eosinophils is one of the main biomarkers that we use in terms of deciding treatment and really important to know um, its limitations in terms of reflecting what's happening in the airway. Um, another thought about you know, suboptimal response is that perhaps dosing might be insufficient to actually suppress airway eosinophilia. Um, and so this is uh, from a study of, um, it was a sequential study of just, I think, 10 patients or 11 patients who got mepolizumab and then they had a 12 month washout and then received a weight, uh, weight adjusted IV resolizumab. And so fixed dose mepolizumab compared to weight adjusted uh, IV resolizumab. And what you can see is that um, in the, on the left-hand side, uh, you're seeing sputum eosinophils and the right-hand side, you're seeing blood eosinophils. And the pre-post um, mepo, really there's no significant difference in terms of sputum eosinophils, um, even in the setting of a significant drop in blood eosinophils. Whereas with the um, weight adjusted IV resolizumab, you see a dramatic reduction in sputum eosinophils and blood eosinophils. So perhaps it might be a dosing issue um, in terms of really attenuating eosinophils in the airways. Um, another thought is that, you know, maybe you know, we're, we're selectively blocking certain cytokines or alarmants with our biologics. In the case of DUPI, we're kind of blocking two pathways, IL-4 and IL-13. Um, and so maybe it's just that other cytokines become important for kind of um, allowing persistent airway inflammation to occur and also for allowing in situ eosinophilic poiesis. So eosinophilic poiesis happening in the tissue. Um, and so uh, what you see here, this is um, uh, a figure kind of depicting the life cycle of an eosinophil. Eosinophils uh, develop from hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow and under the influence of um, GATA1, PU1, and CEBP, they, uh, those transcriptin fractures really kind of commit them to the eosinophil lineage. And then IL-3, IL-5, and GNCSF are important for um, driving eosinophils uh, in terms of maturation. IL-5 is the main cytokine that's important in recruiting eosinophils into the blood. And then there are a number of factors listed in panel B, prostaglandin eotaxins, and then 5-OXOETE, which are important in uh, recruiting eosinophils into the tissue to all of these target organs that they all go to. But perhaps what's happening at the level of the lung is a little bit different than what we see in the bone marrow. And so in the case specifically of anti-L5 agents, maybe we're just not hitting the right target, or there, are, there is some redundancy in terms of signaling that allows eosinophils to persist in the lungs and kind of drive inflammation. And so some proposed cytokines that might be at play there include um, the alarmins, IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP, as well as IL-3 and GMCSF, which are both cytokines that use a common beta receptor with IL-5, and so there's known to be signaling uh, redundancy with those cytokines, and, um, uh, and they are known to be secreted by lung epithelial cells and T cells as well. And then lastly, you know, the last kind of mechanism that's proposed um, for this suboptimal response to biologics is this idea of airway autoimmunity and the fact that airway autoimmune mechanisms may actually be interfering with the effect of biologics. And so what you can see here is um, uh, this is a graph of anti-EPX IgG, which is one kind of autoantibody that's been um, studied in the airways. And both anti-EPX IgG and just sputum ANAs have been shown to be increased in patients with asthma, and especially so in patients with severe asthma that's dependent on oral corticosteroids. And so um, in this uh, figure here, you see on the far right are, are healthy controls, and then you see eosinophilic uh, asthmatics in the center and on the far right. Um, uh, separated by whether they're on ICS alone versus maintenance oral corticosteroids. And really in the oral corticosteroid dependent cohort, there is much higher levels of um, anti-EPX IgG. And so maybe this is another factor in, uh, that is promoting airway inflammation in these patients that uh, perhaps biologics are not addressing. To get a little more meat behind that, there's also been studies looking at biologic therapy in the context of anti-EPX uh, IgG levels in the sputum. And so this is from a study that looked at 
um, anti-L5 biologics. It was not a huge study, and so they pulled all of the biologic treated patients together, so they didn't look specifically at patients treated with different, uh, different biologic. Um, but what they found was that they looked at anti-EPX IgG levels on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left, <laughs> on the right-hand side. Um, they looked at uh, co composite as airway autoreactivity score, so this kind of score of airway autoreactivity. And they looked at a few other ones that I'm not showing here, um, a few other kind of measures of airway autoreactivity, and saw no difference um, in terms of uh, biologic treatment with anti-L5 agents. And then interestingly, I didn't show this, but they also saw no difference in anti-EPX IgG levels or in asthma, um, uh, uh, the composite asthma airway autoreactivity score um, when they looked at a uh, level of ICS treatment or oral corticosteroids. So this phenomena seemed to be completely independent of the standard therapies that we give. Um, and then uh, lastly, this is kind of a separate study that looked at airway autoreactivity and uh, specifically measured markers of airway autoreactivity that are shown oh, this works here, at the top here, um, and uh, also looked at a number of different cytokines in the sputum as well, trying to find uh, predictors for, um, uh, for uh, response to biologic treatment. I will not go over kind of what they defined as treatment or not in this study, just because I, I think it's like a little bit too much in the weeds. But um, what they found was that anti-EPX IgG levels in the airway were the best predictor, actually, in their univariate and multivariate analyses for um, response to uh, biologic treatment, and mebolizumab specifically in this study. So, you know, those are a bunch of different kind of mechanisms for why one might not be responding um, adequately to uh, a biologic. And then in terms of studies that have actually looked at exacerbations occurring on biologics and tried to characterize them, which I fully recognize is the title of my talk, there's not too many of them, um, which I learned very quickly after I started <laughs> working on this presentation. Mm -hmm. But there are two that I'll, I'll highlight. Um, this is a study that looked at, um, uh, and just in general, this is an area of interest of mine, and Dr. Chubb and I have talked about this a lot, because getting patients in to sample them, whether it be blood or sputum, like during an acute flare before they start prednisone is very difficult to do, as outlined by the numbers um, in these studies. But this was one study that looked at patients while they were flaring on uh, mepolizumab. And so on the uh, left-hand side of the table, you can see those were, um, uh, that's data from asthma exacerbations that were assessed in these patients on mepolizumab before they started treatment with prednisone. And then on the right, those were, were exacerbation data that they obtained after the patients had already started prednisone. So we'll focus on the left-hand side. And what you can see is that for one, the mean visual analog scale, that scale of sad to happy faces that we ask patients to look at and tell us how they're feeling, that um, was significant, the change in that from baseline was significantly lower in the mepolizumab group. So while patients do still flare on mepolizumab, maybe 50% of the time, um, uh, it seems like at least from a patient perspective, based on that one parameter, maybe the flares are not quite as, um, as severe in terms of symptoms. And then the other finding that they saw was that sputum eosinophils were significantly lower in, um, in the patients who had flares on, on mepolizumab, which is not uh, super surprising compared to placebo. And then the next study, which was published um, a little more recently, was a study that looked at um, uh, exacerbations as well um, and characterized sputum from patients who had exacerbations, again, on mepolizumab. And so what they did was they included 140 patients in the study. All of them were adults. They had severe eosinophilic asthma. They had genus step four or five, and they were quite a severe cohort. They either had maintenance oral corticosteroid um, dependent asthma, or they had four or more exacerbations in the last year. So uh, pretty severe exacerbation prone patients. And what they found was 53 of the patients were exacerbation free during the study. Um, and uh, 172, uh, excuse me, 87 of the patients had exacerbations, and they had a total of 172 exacerbations uh, that they documented in the study. Of those, 96 of them were assessed, meaning they were able to assess uh, the patient before starting treatment, and 72 were missed. And then of those 96, about 45 were able to provide a sputum sample, and so they looked at the sputum of those 
45 exacerbations on mepolizumab. And what they found were, was that these exacerbations really fell into two categories that they termed SE high for sputum eosinophil high exacerbations. Those were defined by sputum eosinophil count of greater than 2% or SE low exacerbations defined by a um, uh, eosinophil uh, count in the sputum of less than 2%. And they saw that these sputum eosinophil high exacerbations had tended to have an increased pheno, impaired lung function, and a higher blood eosinophil count. And interesting, these sputum eosinophil low exacerbations were characterized by a higher CRP, a higher neutrophil count in the sputum, and then also were more likely to be treated with antibiotics. And so, you know, what the triggers were for these exacerbations, we don't know. Maybe you know, they were different triggers that accounts for this difference that we're seeing in the sputum. Um, but you know, what's kind of proposed by the authors who in full transparency are funded by the manufacturers of mepolizumab is that if a patient has an exacerbation on, um, on mepolizumab, perhaps we should be looking at that exacerbation more closely in terms of the phenotype of exacerbation and then potentially treating them differently and making decisions about biologic adjustment differently based on that. And so just a few take home points um, and then I'll wrap up with um, uh, just like a few more points about my research and some research that we have ongoing. Um, so we talked about the prevalence of severe asthma, which is about five to 10% of patients with asthma. We talked a little bit about risk factors for exacerbations, um, some of which are pulmonary and some of which are extra pulmonary. We didn't cover all of them, but I've included a, a list here um, for you. And then we talked about, you know, the efficacy of asthma biologics in, in clinical trials, which seem to all reduce biologics by about 50% as well as the real world effectiveness of biologics um, with response rates in the you know, 70 to 85% range for uh, the different medications and then non-response rates closer to 15 to 30%. We talked about some reasons for suboptimal response to biologics. So those include you know, inadequate prediction of airway eosinophils based off of the blood eosinophil biomarker that we used, inadequate dosing to diminish airway eosinophilia, maybe some alternative cytokines that are important in driving ongoing inflammation, and this idea of um, airway autoimmune uh, phenomena that might be important. And then we talked a little bit about the MEX study, um, which characterized exacerbations of sputum eosinophil high versus sputum eosinophil low. And lastly, I think you know future work is, is needed in terms of examining characteristics of these uh, breakthrough exacerbations in more detail to understand you know, how they differ you know, based on their triggers and how we might manage them differently. And also um, potentially identifying new biomarkers for disease that might help us to better predict good candidates and uh, predict response to certain treatments. And so um, this is a quote from a review that was published you know, six years ago, but I think is an inspiring one for me as a budding physician scientist and also you know, you know, for all of us that we should always be striving for more. Um, I think this is still relevant now, six years later. I think you know, we need to go beyond blood eosinophil counts, uh, nitric oxide and presence of viral infections. There are probably other markers yet to be discovered that will guide more effective treatment of severe asthma and we should commit to finding them. And so um, I'll wrap up just very briefly with some of the work that I've done in this area. I can't say that I've discovered any new biomarkers, but I've looked, um, Dr. Gomez alluded to this a little bit. I spent my fellowship um, project years kind of looking at sputum eosinophils in children from the Muppets 2 cohort. And so uh, the Muppets 2 clinical trial was a randomized control multi-center trial through the Inner City Asthma Consortium. And it looked at mepolizumab's efficacy in reducing asthma exacerbations in children across the United States. And so as a sub-study of that, I was able to look at sputum samples from 53 children with asthma, 22 of whom received mepolizumab and 31 who received placebo. All of the uh, children underwent sputum induction at the end of the study after 12 months of treatment with either mepolizumab or placebo, and all of their sputum was processed for Cytoff. And so my findings are, are kind of highlighted in the bottom of this graphical abstract here. Um, we found that mepolizumab did significantly reduce sputum eosinophils in these children, and that three distinct eosinophil subpopulations um, emerged with uh, variable expression of L-selectin or CD62L. We also found, you can see right here in this panel, we found that the eosinophil subpopulations in these, uh, the sputum samples from these children had pretty distinct phenotypes with CD62L intermediate eosinophils shown here with a very activated phenotype 
This is a representative heat map of our data with, um, with eosinophil activation markers on the right here. And then CD62L high eosinophils were uh, the next most activated uh, subtype. And we lastly found that both of these subpopulations of eosinophils are significantly increased in children who have exacerbations on mepolizumab compared to those who are exacerbation free during the study. And so this data comes from a single time point looking back at exacerbation history. And so I think you know, more work is needed to understand how biologics change um, eosinophils in the airways and kind of what the role of these subpopulations might be in terms of uh, hopefully you know, predicting response to treatment in the future. And with that, I think I'm on decent time. I'll just make a plug for a few studies that are uh, either coming down the pike or ongoing here through our YCAD program in case anybody here has any patients that might be good for them. We have the Epiphany study, which is a really cool study that I believe in the next few weeks, we'll be enrolling patients here. Um, that is a, a study, of, a crossover study of Dupixin and Facenra examining sputum and also collecting um, blood and nasal samples, looking at transcriptomic signatures before and after these treatments to better understand both asthma heterogeneity and hopefully identify biomarkers of disease as well. And then the diligence study is a, a study that we have ongoing. We've enrolled three patients so far. Um, that's a study before of uh, sputum before and after uh, mepolizumab treatment. It's a prospective study where we're looking at changes in sputum eosinophils and other immune cells in the sputum uh, before and after treatment. And then lastly, we have the reimagined study. This is our very own real world effectiveness study here at Yale looking at uh, the effect, uh, eff effectiveness of mepolizumab in achieving clinical remission in asthma. And so with that, I just will acknowledge, you know, our whole Yale team, definitely Dr. Chupp, who's been a primary mentor of mine, um, Dr. Montgomery as well, and then all of our YCAD providers um, and the whole YCAD team. I have our kind of research team at the bottom, Nicole, um, Jean, and Olivia are our, uh, our core research team, and then um, some of our lab members and uh, members of the Chupp lab in general. Top right are just, you know, um, really instrumental um, investigators from other sites that have helped me with the Muppets project, our leadership in, in pulmonary critical care, the fellows here, and then obviously the applicants who are joining us online. Thank you so much for joining us. And then my family, <laughs> my husband, Andy, and my two boys. So. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Um, any questions? He can all hear you. Hey, Gabby. <laughs> I figured it out. It took me like 10 minutes to figure out the mic. Uh, congratulations. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, um, I have a question related to the, um, the differential effects according to sex. I, you know, asthma is a sexually dimorphic disease. And, and I think the more we learn about it, the more we hear about it, the more that, that dimorphism becomes more apparent. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on a sexually dimorphic response in, in these biologics. If you see it, if it's, you know, if there's thoughts about it, if people respond differently to them. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, from the data I shared, I think that uh, two of the biologics, mepolizumab and du uh, dupilumab, both, uh, both of them, non-responders tended to be females. I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting question. I know Shannon does some gender studies and asthma, so she might be a better person to ask me than me about this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we know that prevalence in terms of gender for asthma starts out in childhood more prevalent among um, uh, male sex and then increasing following puberty in, in female sex. And so there are, are definitely differences um, in terms of, uh, of prevalence uh, between sexes depending on age. And I assume probably some hormonal changes as well, given that change around puberty. Um, and I'm, you know, I think I don't know the literature about uh, you know, diving deeper into differential responses to biologics specifically, but I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Great talk. Um, I, my question relates to uh, the issue of whether and when to switch biologics in people who are non-responders. I was recently at the ERS meeting attending a session at which the speaker said that they showed a graph similar to the one that you showed about the crossover of you know, starting out with response and then switching to non-response or the other way around. And the two points that were made were that a fair number of people who may not even be responders initially, even after several months, may become responders. And the other concern was that people may be developing antibodies against the biologics themselves that are rendering those biologic agents less effective, and that if you have a severe asthmatic, one should not be switching biologic agents in any kind of hastened way because a, that person who may not be a responder initially may become a responder, and B, if you sort of shoot your options early by switching from one to the next to the next and you get antibodies, you may run out of options. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a really excellent question. Um, I think, you know, the at this point, we, there's no formal guidance in terms of when exactly to assess biologic response and when to decide about switching biologics. And I think you bring up two really good reasons why you might want to uh, hold off on, on this decision of switching without um, uh, doing so too quickly. I think generally speaking, anecdotally from our discussions on our meetings, usually we think about assessing somewhere around six months for response. And I, I think that in the, in the majority of cases, uh, switching would be um, considered if patients uh, certainly are worsening on treatment and then, which, which has been shown in, in some cases. And then um, at the six month mark, I think uh, really that would be the main reason for switching biologics, unless you really see no response, um, in which case, you know, in some of the literature suggests checking things like blood eosinophils, especially on these T2 biologics to see if there's been a drastic change to suggest the presence of anti-drug antibodies or that sort of thing. And so, again, with no clear guidance, these are some things that we think about and talk about on our discussions, but I don't think that there's um, you know, a clear right answer yet. Hey, Gabby, thanks. That was such a great talk. Uh, really game-changing for me, actually. So um, a lot of times um, I'm seeing patients with COPD that have a little bit of Th2 phenotype, some eosinophilia, maybe um, bronchoreactivity, allergies, I'm wondering if you see a role for biologics in the COPD asthma population. Yeah, I'm, that is a very active area of research. And I think there's some you know, positive data for dupilumab in patients um, with COPD. And kind of, it, it is very common yet to see this overlap of COPD with these kind of uh, uh, evidence of T2 inflammation. I think you know, um, there's definitely going to be, I think, more forthcoming studies for this that hopefully will inform us better in terms of really the role. It's very funny you asked that because I uh, presented like, you know, two options in my mind of what to talk about today. And that was the next, the other alternative. And so maybe if I'm invited back, <laughs> I can expand upon that. Um, but yeah, I think that we'll be seeing a lot more information about that in the coming uh Gabby, yeah, reassured that we will have you back to talk about that because <laughs> it's an evolving field, no question. A couple of quick questions. One is, do we know why folks with a higher BMI, with a high BMI, are more likely to exacerbate? Um, and two, you didn't mention too much about costs, and I know our audience, particularly our fellows attending, might want to know something about the issues of coverage, insurance, and cost. How much do these cost? Yeah, great both great questions. So in terms of the BMI question, we know that obesity um, related asthma presents a little bit differently in some ways from an immune perspective. Um, there's been studies looking at different cytokines that are important in driving asthma, particularly in obese patients. And cytokines like IL-6 and IL-8 have been shown to be increased in those patients. And so there may be some degree of, um, you know, different immune pathways that are driving disease. What I didn't show here, but mentioned on one of the summary slides is that actually um, in a, a separate study that um, I took out because I didn't want to go over time, uh, there was a separate study looking at traits that are associated with exacerbations that show that actually 
underweight patients, um, underweight BMI under 18.5 is also associated with exacerbations. And so um, really the extremes of BMI, it seems like um, are associated with exacerbations. And then in terms of cost, you know, um, that these are obviously very expensive medications. Um, and so, you know, that is another factor that I feel like we probably don't appreciate enough when we're kind of trialing biologics and deciding about switching and kind of waiting to see a response because these are, are really expensive things that we're putting, uh, really expensive medicines that we're putting our patients on. Um, generally speaking, um, we get a lot of support from our pharmacist, Nino, to help us with cost. And there are some ways to get around big copays for patients. The copays, depending on insurance, really range for patients. Um, but one way that we've found that I think is probably fine to say in this forum is that having patients get in-clinic injections generally is more affordable for them and easier to get covered. And so um, that is one kind of way we get around cost. Um, uh, but uh, certainly cost is, is a really important factor in this. Thanks, Gabby. Um, I also feel like I learned a lot from your talk too, even as an asthma provider. <laughs> um, this is a very timely talk because yesterday I had a patient who has been well-controlled on Dupixent for a while and just had a flare like a month or so ago and has some increase in symptoms very specifically related to an exposure. Um, and so it seems as though he has mold or something going on in his bedroom and his symptoms are very well correlated with being in his bedroom improve when he's not there he's like been sleeping on an air mattress in the living room and so I'm not he's on Dupixin um, I'm not considering him a treatment failure because I think this is very related to this exposure although I'm sort of curious as to like he's clearly still able to exacerbate from an eosinophilic perspective from an airway inflammation perspective despite being on this drug and so I also thought like would there be a, would there be an opportunity to switch because would something else be better and be able to have reduced his flare with this exposure but it did lead me to think like you know none of the studies that you mentioned looked at the exposures that people have and asthma is such a direct correlation with your exposure and even the prevalence of asthma like you're not prevalence i'm sorry like the incidence of getting asthma is has a lot to do with what you were exposed to in your childhood or, you know, I don't, we don't understand why people get asthma and some people do and some people don't and what makes them become eosinophilic and have allergies and, and everything. And so I'm curious as to whether there's been any information as to at the exposures, what types of exposures or at what time period of your life exposures would develop this and then whether these exacerbations or these eosinophilic subgroups or biomarkers are ever going to be subcategoried into an exposure of this type is going to make it more likely or exposures of, you know, ongoing home exposures of pests or yeah. ongoing dust or, you know, cigarette smoking before age, whatever. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of that or feel like that's going to be something that ends up being a subcategorization in the future. Yeah, I think, you know, all of the comments that you just said are really important and and your thought process around that particular patient seems totally reasonable. I think, um, you know, I, I think that in general, like looking into reasons for exacerbations, irrespective of treatment failure or not, you know, there are clearly different triggers we know about for asthma exacerbations. And there are definitely some data to suggest that different triggers cause different immune pathways to lead to the end result of an exacerbation. Um, there was a, a transcriptomic analysis of nasal samples looking at kids who had allergen exposure compared to virus uh, exposure by um, Matt Altman's group published a few years ago in Nature, and there were distinct transcriptomic profiles in the nose depending on which trigger you had for your exacerbation. And there's other studies looking specifically at how certain viruses trigger exacerbations that are probably distinct from allergen exposure. And so I think, you know, the MEX study was the first one to look at, you know, diff kind of characterizing these exacerbations from a phenotype perspective on biologic. But I think we need a little bit more of that to really understand, like you pointed out, like, would this be, you know, would certain biologics be better for this man who has mold in his bedroom and is exacerbating in that setting versus should I just keep him on Dupixent and, you know, control his triggers and know that no other biologic that's currently available would have, would have made a difference. So, so Gabby, just to follow up on Isabel's question, 
I'm, I'm thinking that if I were put in charge of designing these asthma studies, I would get a huge headache because this seems really difficult, right? Because because I'm thinking there's a lot of noise in the system. There's probably a lot of treatment variability, like what is an exacerbation that you want to call an exacerbation. Mm -hmm. You've got a menu of outcomes that you could study, not just exacerbation, but quality of life and things like that. So I'd worry that if you're doing a study and isolating a particular outcome, you may be missing other outcomes. Yeah. Like people might feel better, but they're still having no change in the number of exacerbations. So how do you how do you get around that or think about that reality when you're interpreting these studies? Yeah, I th I mean that's a, a great point. You know, I think in terms of um, you know interpreting these studies, I think it is difficult, right? Because a lot of the studies have different you know, populations and severity of disease and comorbidities and, and aren't necessarily controlling for all of those variables. And so I think, you, you know, I don't think that there's a, a magic answer as to how to interpret those and, and you know, know how to apply all of that, um, uh, you know, or at least I certainly am not of the level that I can do it. But I think, you know, looking uh, across studies at uh, similarities and similar findings. And if, if you look at like the literature base for this stuff that I talked about today, there's so many studies that are asking the same question. And so hopefully finding unifying answers between those studies, I think is our best bet in terms of drawing real conclusions from these very hard kind of questions to ask in this complex disease. There's a comment from Dr. Redlick here in the chat. Um, so she is, uh, you know, bringing something that is really important in terms of like occupational ex exposures, right? In terms of like how they drive not only like, you know, incidents and also, but also kind of like persistence of symptoms, right? Like for example, like teachers or many workers that don't have control over their environments that drive their disease. Um, so I guess in a way, you know, when you think, when we think about biologics, you know, they're just a part of, of the whole arsenal, right? That we have in terms of like, you know, perhaps, you know, we, we probably also need to consider how can we modify environments, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, often I, I think, you know, particularly here in New Haven, you know, we have a big issue with housing mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just like really difficult to control environments. So any thoughts in, in terms of like how maybe we can couple you know, kind of like our traditional treatments with environmental interventions before, you know, as part of our algorithm or how we approach uh, patient management. Yeah, I do because I've been on service a few times with Dr. Redlick and she tells us we all need to refer to occupational medicine more. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, jokes aside, I think certainly environment plays a huge role and clearly we do see these, um, these certain uh, environmental triggers. And so I think, working together with occupational medicine really is an actually important thing because I think that they have um, uh, resources that we might not know about or you know be experienced enough in using to address some of these other factors that are outside of our immediate control in the clinic. Thank you so much. much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Gabby. Uh, we really appreciate your you know uh, participation today and really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks.